Hey everyone, welcome to this video on Fourier transforms in MATLAB. I want to start by saying that I am no professional in terms of teaching the Fourier transform. Okay, that takes a whole class in data signal processing or differential equations or whatever you're doing. I can, however, show you one method to taking the Fourier transform in MATLAB. There's a lot of variations that you're going to see throughout online help articles, whether you want full phase spectrums, half phase spectrums, conserving power. There's so much that goes on with the Fourier transforms. I'm going to try to show you the simplest and most broken down approach and we'll take little baby steps along the way to do that. We're gonna start off with some raw data that I have right here and define a few parameters that describe that data. Then we're gonna go ahead and take the Fourier transform of that data and we can create the phase spectrum and the amplitude spectrum. Those are the two very important graphs that we typically see and those are both plotted versus the frequency domain. Right, we're going from time to frequency with the Fourier transform. After we see those graphs, we'll talk about reconstructing data using just the dominant Fourier transform frequencies. And then we'll create a side-by-side -side plot to compare the reconstructed data with the original raw data. Let's get to it. First thing, just to clarify, this of course has to be the discrete Fourier transform, right? We don't have continuous functions because we're starting off with 32 raw data points. Here we have the actual X values that can be considered the input to the Fourier transform. And we've also got this time variable defined here, which is how our data is spaced. We were sampling every 0.5 seconds and we got this data, which we'll call sea level height, and that's in meters. Our T is in seconds. These are the few parameters that we need to define to start. L is just the length of X, which is simply the number of samples or data points that we have. FS is the sampling frequency. And we know that the data is 0.5 seconds apart, so we could just set that equal to 0.5. But I wanna make this generic, so if you have maybe raw data that came from the field, you're not going to have a nice variable t. What you'll want to do is take the difference between all the t values, and then you take the mean of that difference, and that'll give you one value, which is your average sampling frequency between your raw data. Again, that's just 0 0.5 in our case. And then lastly, you need to define frequency. Okay, frequency is what we're going to be plotting when we create our phase spectrum and our amplitude spectrum graphs. Frequency will be on the x-axis, and you define it as shown here. You're gonna start with zero, because the first value in your Fourier transform will be zero for frequency. And you'll go to the number of points that are in that raw data, minus one. And then you're gonna multiply by that sampling frequency and divide by the total number of points. It might not be super intuitive, but I like to think of the units that are being used in this scenario fs here the sampling frequency is in samples per second and if you divide out the number of total samples you end up with just one over second which is hertz and hertz is frequency this is going to give us the full spectrum if you guys are more in tune with the Fourier analyses some people like to create half spectrum i'm going to stay full spectrum with data that has a mean to it some people like to zero mean data I'm just going to keep the mean in there and we'll see how that plays into our analysis as we go here. First thing to do, always just start off and make sure that your raw data makes sense. So I'm going ahead and plotting just our time versus our X raw data. I'm just gonna put on some values here and we'll take a look at this. So here's what we got. You can tell it already has a sinusoidal or cosine shape to this, right? That's just our raw data. You can also plot it simply as the data points themselves instead of a line. Sometimes the lines can be misleading, but here we have our data points. And these are the data points that we'll be putting through the Fourier transform, right? These data points mean that we're doing a discrete FFT, fast Fourier transform. Data's looking good. So we'll move on to actually taking the FFT. Now MATLAB has this great function, FFT, 
you can do help FFT in your command window, and you'll get a full explanation of what it's actually doing, and even gives you a hint on the algorithm that it's performing as well. But basically, it's the discrete Fourier transform of the vector x. That's what we'll do. Here, we, we, here we specify a capital X, and we're inputting little x, all right? Now, we're going to run this, and I want to show you just what x looks like, because there's a lot of confusion typically on what FFT outputs. Look at all this stuff, okay? This is a mess to work with, but check it out. This is simply a complex number. Negative 5, minus 2, blah, blah, blah. I, okay? So these have real parts and imaginary parts. If you tried to plot just that, you'd get <laughs> absolute trash. Okay, let me show you. Plot X. Run that. Take a look. This is what you'd get, which looks like garbage. Firstly, because you're not plotting it as actual data points. We can do that, and that might help a little bit. Let's take a look at our plot. And now you're seeing, okay, there's some data points in here. It's also, notice how on the x-axis here, this is our real number. And on the y-axis, that's our imaginary axis. It's symmetric across, you know, if you flip this across the x-axis, that's important and we'll see it later. But this isn't the typical graph we see, right? In the typical graph, we want a phase spectrum and an amplitude spectrum. So let's work our way there. Before that, we need to normalize that x, okay, by dividing by the number of data points. That's a super important step. It's just the way that that FFT function works. You have to divide out by the number of terms that you put into it. Okay, it's very important. All your values will be wrong if you don't do that. Keep in mind that we're also going to have to multiply by L when we're trying to do the inverse Fourier transform near the end of this video. You'll see us do that momentarily. To get the amplitude in the phase spectrum, let's start by creating another figure, and we're going to do two subplots side by side. The call here is that we want a one row by two column subplot, and the following plot will be in the first position, which is on the left. Same thing down here, one row by two subplot, and we'll put the next plot on the second position to the right. We're going to plot F, our frequency, which you defined up there, plot f by the absolute value of x norm. If you're confused, think back to complex numbers. Complex numbers on that graph that I showed you have an angle and they have an amplitude. To get the amplitude, we use the absolute value. To get the angle, we use MATLAB's angle function, okay? And you're doing this to that normalized FFT here, okay? We have to divide up by L. So we're going to plot f versus the absolute value of x norm, and then plot f versus the angle of x norm. And I've just added some x labels and some y labels to make this a lot more clear. Let's go ahead and plot this. Might look like trash, still a new graph and we can make it a bit nicer. But you can see now that we've started to get values on this plot. Some people like to use stem plots, I'm not a huge fan. But if you want to do a stem plot, you just have to add stem here for both. I'm going to change this back to a star. And if we plot that, now we're going to end up with some stem plots. First thing to note, the first term over here in our amplitude spectrum is going to be the mean of our data set. Why is that? Well, think about what this value would be when we reconstruct. So 1.8 would be times the cosine of zero, which is the frequency, plus a phase angle of zero. So it's just 1.8 for all the values. I'd be getting ahead of myself, but let me just write out what that general form would look like. Really what's happening, two times pi times f plus, let's call it phase for now. Remember, the Fourier transform is breaking things down into sine and cosine curves. Okay, and to do that, there's three parameters that define your curves. You're going to have an amplitude, you're going to have a frequency, and you're going to have a phase angle. Right, that identifies a unique cosine curve that can go onto your graph. 
So from these spectrums, oh, it's already, let me pull it up again here. From these spectrums, we get, from the amplitude spectrum, you get A, you get that amplitude. The frequency you get from this frequency axis, and then the phase you get from the amplitude on the phase angle graph. And these are what you're going to input if you wanted to manually reconstruct. You'd create this, and then you'd do it for however many frequencies you wanted. Okay, we're not going to do that because MATLAB has an inverse FFT function we're going to utilize, but it's important to know kind of how this is breaking down. Okay. That's good for now. I'm just going to add grids to these plots, makes them a bit nicer. And then if you did want these to be a bit more kind of bolded, you can add line width and then input two. And you'll see that we'll get a bit of a more distinguishable graph. That's a bit more visually pleasing. Great. And of course, probably add some titles if you had to turn this in for an assignment or something like that. But the left graph is the amplitude spectrum and the right graph is the phase spectrum. Note that both the x-axes are frequency and hertz. All right, from here, what's next? I like to make a table of the coefficients, the frequencies, the amplitudes, and the angles. This is good just to confirm that you know what's going on. It takes the information we just plotted it. It makes it a bit nicer. All we're doing here is using the table function, passing in these values. So x norm right now is a 1 by 32. I'm adding the transpose just to create that into a column as opposed to a horizontal vector. So we're making all these vertical, same with frequency, taking the absolute value again of this and then getting the angle. And then just changing the properties so I have nice titles above all my rows. If we do this in our output now, you've got a nice table of the raw coefficients, of the frequency that relates to it, of the amplitude, and the phase. Remember, these are all those things that make up our unique cosine and sine curves. So if you wanted to reconstruct, you'd grab this frequency, this amplitude, and this phase, and you'd do it for however many dominant frequencies that you want. Great. Let's take one more look at our amplitude spectrum. So keep in mind that the values shown here are going to affect, right, the amplitude that we have of these affect the amplitude of a sinusoid. The cosine portion of the general curve can only vary between 0 and 1. If I still have that code, let me see here. Not here. Let me just write it again. All right, we have A cosine 2 times pi times F plus the phase angle. All right, this portion can only vary between 0 or negative 1 and 1. Right, that's the nature of cosine. So if we multiply it by A, then it can vary from negative A to A. If we look on our amplitude plot, some of these amplitudes are only, I mean, heck, this guy right here is only 0.015, right? That's not going to really influence our data that much, even if we constructed that curve, right? You'd have, it would vary from negative 0.01 to positive 0.01. That's hardly going to affect your data because our data, if we take a look again, our raw data is going from, you know, values of 2 down to near 0 up to, you know, 3. So a 0.01 change is really, really small in comparison to these values. So that's why people begin to talk about dominant frequencies in the first place. They only want you to use, when you reconstruct, the first few frequencies. In this case, we start off with the mean value, and then we have a couple dominant frequencies here that we'll work with. Close out of that, and we'll move on with our code. We have our nice table made. This is what we're talking about, dominant frequencies. Okay, we want to then isolate these dominant frequencies. If you notice on the plot, I'm gonna make it again here. If you notice on the plot, we also have frequencies that are looking to be dominant on the right-hand side. And this is due to symmetry that we see in these Fourier transform plots. In fact, some people like to slice this graph in half and then reflect it, you know, flip it around and put it on the other side. So it kind of looks like it comes to a peak and then bridges down like this. I'm not going to do that again. I'm trying not to go crazy with these graphs. But if we take a look at this point and at this point, what do you notice? Look at the y values. 
they're the exact same. Okay, that's not a coincidence. Let's take a look at this one. And this one, it's the exact same, right? The Y is 0.27 something. That symmetry is important, and that symmetry is natural to the FFT, and that symmetry will give us proper reconstructed values afterwards. So we have to keep these values together if we want to keep these values together. What that means is when we isolate those dominant frequencies, we can't forget the second half of the spectrum. It's going to be just as important. So I like to talk about these with the mean being one value that we keep, and then from there, we'll keep a certain number of these frequencies. So if I wanted to keep three of them, I'd keep this one here, this one here, the three that I have the bubbles on, because those are the ones that actually have some reasonable amplitudes. And that means that we also have to keep and work with the three at the end of the spectrum. To do this, I've introduced a for loop to the code. Let's take a look at that now, right here. This is probably one of the most complicated parts of this code. I'm first going to create an X recon, okay? And that's going to be the same as our X. Okay, remember what our X, this isn't X normed now. We're using our basic X, okay? So X is just the output of the original Fourier transform that we did. So X recon here is just X, okay? Now remember I, I mentioned wanting to keep that first number of k values and the last number of k values and also the mean, okay? And just to show you that this mean is actually 1.8 as we've seen on that graph, if we just do mean of x, we'll see 1.8. And that's the mean of the data that we see right here, 1.801, perfect. Okay, sorry for the aside k equals 4. That means we're going to keep the first 4 and the last 4 values and the mean. And we're then going to use those to reconstruct. So I'm going to make a loop that goes from i equals k plus 2. So starting with the 6th term, because k equals 4, and going to the l is the total number of terms, so 32 minus 4. So going to the 28th term, I'm going to set those values in x recon to zero. Okay, so our, our end x recon value will look like this. And recon is short for reconstruction. So here, we're going to still have the same number of values. We're going to have 32 total values, but we've kept that mean value, and we've kept the first, second, third, and fourth dominant frequencies. Everything else is zero in between, and we've kept the last first last second, last third, and last fourth frequencies. Okay, see how we did that? That's all from this loop right here. And now we can use MATLAB's IFFT function. Need to do that here. So now we'll do the inverse Fourier transform. Let's actually keep this as a capital X so that we know that these are still in the Fourier realm, right? We still have these as complex numbers, so we consider them to be coefficients. And what we need to do is do x equals i f of t of x recon. If we run that, let's see what we get. Real values. See these? We've undone the f of t, and we've used only those reconstructed values that we wanted to. If we passed in the entire data set and did of x, we're simply undoing the original operation, and we should get back the 100% original raw data. I can show you that. Let me scroll to the top here. 1.97, 1.46, 1 1.97, 1, right? It gives the exact same thing back, because all we're doing is just undoing this FFT right here. We don't want to do that because we want to actually just look at the dominant frequencies, which is why we created this X recon and then passed it back through here. We should call that X recon. Lowercase, because now this is back to raw data. And uppercase, we use to show that these are the complex numbers from the Fourier transform. Great. So now we have actual X data that we can work with. We can go ahead and plot that. Let's create another figure here.
This will be our third figure now, lots of graphs. And we're going to plot the original data, t and x. Then we'll plot the reconstructed data, t and x recon. Let's see how this looks. Fingers crossed. Boom. Look at this. OK. See, now this dashed line is our reconstructed data. It's not perfect, and it shouldn't be perfect, right? because we're only using four dominant terms in our FFT plus that mean. OK? But you can see that we're pretty darn close to the original data. And again, that makes sense because only a few of these frequencies are actually contributing great amounts. Only these first four actually have values of significance. What you can do is then change that value of k in your code right here to show what just fewer would look like. So let's only use two terms. Let's run this. And we're going to use the mean and two terms. And you can see it's, it's a much, much worse fit. Horrible fit. Eh, not horrible. I've seen worse fits. But you get the idea, right? We're not as close. It's still following the general trend. But we're only using, at this point, these frequencies. This guy and this guy. Of course, we also have the mean included in there as well. And thus, we get a worse fit. We could try it with 3. You could try it with 10. Right, if we have 10, should we be closer to the solution? Answer is yes. We should be much closer. Because now we're just taking those insignificant values from here, you know, all these little guys. We're going to still add them in, though. And they'll make an impact. As you can see, the curve is almost perfect at that point. Awesome. Hope you enjoyed this. That's as far as I'm going to go. It gives you the basic decomposition, selecting those important values in this portion of the code, and then doing a very basic reconstruct. There's one thing that I should clarify, by the way. I remember back here, we took out this L and created X norm. If you wanted to still work with X norm, what you could do is simply create this as X norm. And then you just need to do X recon times L. Okay, it just depends on which Fourier transform vector you're working with. We get the same exact thing, right? In one method, we're using x norm, and the x norm, we took out the L, or you can just work with x, in which case you don't need to multiply by that L, and you can just do this. Plot it, and we get the same exact thing. A little trick, by the way, I added to get this to update in the plot. If you're curious, here's the code for that plot. All I'm doing is creating a string called L2 and just appending together this k value, turning that into a string, and then putting that next to this string here. And then you just add that as an argument to your legend command, and that'll make your nice updating automatic legend for you. Great. That's everything with FFTs. Thanks for watching. It's a complex topic, but if you break it down simply like it's shown here, I hope you're starting to see how the FFT is reconstructed, and hopefully this works with your code. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. Cheers. I think we can all learn something from the Fourier transform. If we take all the complexities of life, break them down into core components, and get rid of all the insignificant frequencies, just focus on the dominant frequencies, we're left with giving all of our energy to the things that truly matter day to day.